If you've been playing games for a while, you've probably amassed a massive mountain of unplayed titles that you're probably never going to play thanks to things like Humble Bundle, Epic Game Store, PlayStation Plus and Xbox Game Pass. And at least for me, that's kind of annoying. I've spent the money on these games and the developers have poured their blood, sweat and tears into making them, so I would want to play them and eventually at the very least try every unplayed game that I have in my backlog slash library. So to deal with this, I list all of my unplayed games on Google Sheets, pick 5 games by random, force myself to play them and take you guys along for the experience. This video is a part of a series, so if you're interested in hearing more about why I'm doing this, please check the first part of the series out in the description. Last time, I forgot to add some of the games that I had gotten from PlayStation Plus in my list, so I've added those and of course also the ones I had bought after the last video. And here's the Google Sheets formula that I'll use to pick the games from the list. So without further ado, let's just get into it and start picking the games. For the first game, I got Axiom Verge 2. Never actually played the first one, but it looks very cool. For the second game I got Luftrausers, I probably got this through Humble Bundle or something a very long time ago but I never actually touched it. And for the third game I got Little Inferno. I think this is another one of those games that everyone has in their Steam library and I honestly have no clue where I got it from or when. And for the fourth game I got Bioshock. I know I'm a fake gamer, I never played this one. But I guess now is finally the time to do it. And for the fifth and final game, I got Slime Rancher. Which looks like one of those farming simulator type games, I guess. Alright, so now I'll play all of the games and come back to you with my takes after I'm done. Which should take about a week, so I'll see you soon. Axiom Verge 2 is a metroidvania released in 2021 by Thomas Hap Games a sequel to the first Axiom Verge. I had never actually played the first one, but the sequel was for free on PlayStation Plus, the art style looked nice, and I checked online and it seems like you don't have to really play the first one before this, so I just chucked it on the list and here we are. In Axiom Verge 2, you play as a billionaire CEO of a mega corporation in the year 2053, who receives a mysterious message telling her to go to Antarctica if she wants to see her missing daughter again. And after you arrive in Antarctica, you investigate a bit, something's happened, you drown, and then you wake up in an unfamiliar world, reborn with a sentient robot embedded in your body. And then you do normal metroidvania things, exploring the world of Gengir, where the rest of the game takes place. And I have to say, when I stepped into the game right after the intro section, the pixel art world, together with the unique soundtrack, blew me away. Everything from the distinct background art between each area to the unique enemy designs were top notch. There's this cool repeating theme of blending nature with technology that is apparent in all aspects of the game. You're playing the game as a human that has a robot living inside of them, and especially in the beginning, a lot of the game is set in these overgrown ruins of a past civilization filled with hostile mechanical robots. This blend of themes can be heard in the soundtrack as well, in which the electronic foundations of the music are accompanied by these folksy acoustic and vocal elements that result in a very unique and captivating soundscape. The music on here is legitimately super catchy and I'm still vibing to it now making this video. But the visuals and the soundtrack were unfortunately pretty much the only thing that really stood out positively to me about the game. I lost interest in the story pretty quickly after the intro and for the most of the time Axiom Verge 2 plays just like a normal metroidvania. You explore around the vast world, solving puzzles, finding upgrades and unlocks that allow you to open up more of the world and story piece by piece with every step you take, but when it comes to the combat, it falls short of its contemporaries by a large margin. Your melee weapon is awkwardly short, and your ranged weapon, the boomerang, isn't really fun to use. And even though the game feels like it's trying to focus more on the puzzle and exploration side of things, the levels are still filled with enemies that you have to get through in order to make progress. And if you do decide to fight the enemies, not only is it not very fun, you also don't receive anything for it. 
no XP, money or drops, so it feels like for the most of the time you're just better off running past them and ignoring this part of the game entirely. I also didn't end up finishing the game so I cannot speak for all of them, but the bosses I did face were pretty underwhelming and easy. Bosses in Metroidvanias usually stand as these challenging high points that require thought and strategy and climactically cap off a specific area or a part of the game, but in Axiom Verge 2 they're mostly just there and then you kill them without actually realizing if they were supposed to be a boss or not. Now, I don't think a puzzle and exploration focused metroidvania couldn't be executed well. I just don't think that aspect was explored maybe as bravely as it could have been in this game. And while it didn't hit its mark here, playing this game made me kind of interested in seeing how this concept will be carried out in Animal World when it comes out, which is another promising upcoming metroidvania with a heavy focus on exploration and puzzles. The end result here is a pretty cool game with great exploration and great art and music that is ultimately diluted by its annoying and meaningless combat and underwhelming boss fights. All in all, it's still a cool game and if you can get over its shortcomings, I'm sure you would enjoy it more than I did. Luftrausers is a bullet hell shooter game developed by Blambeer and published by Devolver Digital in 2014. In Luftrausers, you pilot the plane, shoot at enemy planes and boats while dodging their bullets and trying to stay alive. Your goal is to complete the simple missions the game gives you and to get as high a score as possible in order to unlock new parts that you can customize your plane with. At first when I started the game, it felt insanely difficult. I had never played a shooter game like this where you have to take gravity into account while also being only able to move and shoot in the direction you're facing, and it took quite a bit to get used to it. But after some trial and error, and after realizing that you automatically heal by not shooting, I was finally able to play the game properly, and I got to say, this game is actually fantastic. Once you get the hang of it, maneuvering around the bullets and enemies while carefully sending shots their way when you get the chance, feels awesome. The healing mechanic also automatically paces the gameplay in a very effective way. When you're in a tough spot, shooting is risky, and instead you often have to entirely focus on dodging to create some distance until attacking is an option again. This variety in intensity makes the action of piloting the plane feel dynamic and forces you to give it 100% of your focus if you actually want to play well. In addition to this, the customization options for the plane are also really well thought out. You can choose to, instead of normal bullets, shoot for example laser beams, homing missiles or slow moving bombs. You can pick a slow heavy body, a super fast one or a body that ignores impact damage when crashing into the enemies. You also have various options for the thrusters that enable you to for example shoot bullets from behind or to go underwater. The changes that you can make to your plane are all significant and drastically change how the game plays. You could go for a bullet spamming fast moving setup or a slower more deliberate one. Or you could go crazy and choose a setup that is just built solely around slamming into the enemy boats for example. The visual presentation of this game is super clean as well. The simple color scheme is stylish, the flying looks and feels great, and the way that your health is displayed with the constantly changing circle around the plane actually works really well in communicating that danger level when things start getting more chaotic. Luftrausers also shines when it comes to the little things in its design. Like, for example, there's a unique name for every single plane setup that you can put together, and not only that, every one of those 125 combinations also has their own soundtrack, which is absolutely insane. These kinds of unnecessary but also very impactful elements in this game just show how much care and effort was put into its development, and it can really be felt when playing the game as well. My only criticism of the game and I know that this is probably just my fault, is that navigating the menus feels pretty unintuitive. When playing, I kept accidentally starting a game over and over again when trying to switch plane parts, and in the beginning, when looking for the controls, I accidentally mapped literally every single action to one button, and had to remove the control configuration from the game's files in order to fix it. But outside of that, this game is great and I definitely recommend it to you if it looks fun based on what you're seeing. Little Inferno, released in 2012 by Tomorrow Games, 
is a game in which you play as presumably a child who owns a little inferno entertainment fireplace, an actual fireplace where you burn items in order to keep warm in an extremely cold dying world. The game, for the most part, plays like a normal time-gated farmville styled mobile game. You sit in front of the fireplace, buy items from the in-game shop menu, wait for them to arrive, and then burn them in the fireplace by clicking them with your cursor in order to gain more money and to buy more items. You also receive weather reports and letters from your neighbor, which give you some pretty vague crumbs of context of what is really happening around you, and you can also find special combinations of items to burn and gain stamps that allow you to skip some of the wait times and progress in the game faster. While the gameplay loop of buying, waiting and burning started feeling tedious pretty soon after starting the game, as you do spend a lot of time just waiting for the items to arrive, the actual burning physics and effects along with trying to figure out the combos was pretty fun to play around with for a while. The game is also filled with jokes that kept the game at least somewhat interesting and this along with the mystery of the story kept me engaged enough to play it until the end. I'm going to give my take on the story and ending of Little Inferno, so if you don't want to hear spoilers, you can skip forwards a bit. But long story short, I didn't really like it to be honest. The beginning of the game and the mystery of being stuck in front of the fireplace and not knowing what is happening around it, combined with the strong imagery of a child having to burn their toys in order to keep warm in a world that is growing colder every day, were very effective in causing me to rack my brain trying to figure out just what exactly is happening beyond the fireplace. And as I got further in the game, and the waiting times and silences became longer and longer, it left me with even more time to sit silently in front of the fireplace and to anticipate the big reveal I was expecting at the end. And then, I finally got to the end, I had thrown everything into the fireplace, the house had burnt down, and the reveal was so underwhelming to me. As you exit your burnt house and enter the world, it turns out that everything is pretty much normal, except that it's just cold and almost everyone is in their houses addicted to burning things in their fireplaces. You get a message from your neighbor who already burnt down their house earlier, and is now living their life outside, having also now shed their fireplace addiction, just like you just did. Then you go to the offices of the people who created Little Inferno Entertainment Fireplace, meet the inventor of the thing, who, due to the money she has now made, is now escaping the dying freezing earth in a rocket ship to another planet. Then the game ends with you embarking with the weather reporter on his hot air balloon to start your new life after the fireplace. At first when I left the house, I was first of all kind of disappointed to see that the situation outside wasn't quite as dire as I had thought it to be in the beginning. You can still survive outside just fine, and at first I thought the game was some kind of commentary on video game addiction or something like that. But as the fireplace CEO talks to you about chasing your dreams, and you hop on the hot air balloon, it became clearer to me that the game is telling you not to resort to cheap escapism like the fireplace and instead go out in the world and chase your dreams and do what you always wanted to do. By itself, the message is fine, but the way that it's conveyed with the rest of the story was pretty confusing to me. If the fireplace represents this kind of safety and fleeting warmth of escapism and complacency, what does the cold represent? And if embracing the cold, chasing your dreams, is seemingly good for you, why is the world still doomed to freeze to death and what is causing it? And also, why does the person who created the fireplace and subjected this addiction to so many people get to seemingly be the only person who truly gets saved from the cold and escapes the dying planet? The message and the story just felt so vague and undercooked to me, to the point that the three hours or so I spent playing this game felt like an unsatisfying waste of time at the end of it. Also, I know that this is super subjective, but the overall style and the bug-eyed character designs were kind of annoying and off-putting to me as well. All in all, I guess at least the burning mechanics were pretty satisfying and cool at times. And I know that I might have misunderstood the game in some way, and if you have played this and have a better interpretation, please let me know in the comments. But yeah, I didn't really enjoy it. Bioshock, released in 2007 by 2K Games, is a first-person shooter with RPG and horror elements. 
The game is set in the 1960s in a once vibrant massive underwater city, which due to civil war has now descended into chaos with its inhabitants having become insane and dangerous due to the overuse of biological enhancements called plasmids. Bioshock is one of those games that a lot of people consider to be one of the greatest games ever made, and I've thankfully somehow managed to stay pretty unaware of its contents despite its place in the gaming culture. I had only heard that it had a great story and that's it, so I luckily was able to dive into this with pretty much zero preconceived notions. I had the game on PC and on PlayStation via PS Plus, and I actually first started playing the console version, tried to push through it for a few hours, but eventually decided to fold and replay the beginning on PC, because the shooting was just so awkward with the controller. And while constantly missing my shots while stumbling all over the place kind of added to the horror element of the game, switching over to playing it with a keyboard and mouse was definitely the right choice. You start the game off emerging from a plane crash over the Atlantic Ocean. You see a strange tower in the distance and as you are stranded in the middle of the sea, you have no choice but to swim to it. Inside you find an underwater transportation device that takes you to Rapture the city where the game takes place. On the way over, an ambitious sales pitch for the city is played to you with the use of a projector, but as you arrive, you quickly realize that things aren't the same as they once had been. Rapture has been destroyed by war, and most of its inhabitants are now splicers. People addicted to the genetic enhancer Adam, who will attack anyone on site in hopes of extracting it from their victims. You start your journey through Rapture under the guidance of Atlas, a helpful inhabitant of the Rapture who after helping you out in the beginning by communicating with you through a shortwave radio, wishes to, with your assistance, save his wife and son who are trapped in the city, while at the same time the paranoid dictator and founder of Rapture, Andrew Ryan, sees you as a threat and attempts to stop you in any way he can. As you explore Rapture, you find a lot of audio diaries that provide little pieces of context about life in Rapture before and during its collapse, and this storytelling method works great in Bioshock as the little snapshots of how life used to be seamlessly contrast with how apocalyptic it is now. And while there are a lot of them, the diaries don't even really interrupt the gameplay at any point. You can just keep playing the game normally as the messages keep playing in the background, immersing you deeper and deeper into the story. I won't go any further into the story than that though, as there are many fantastic twists and turns in it that I think are better to be experienced firsthand without any spoilers. But I have to say that I really did enjoy it, even if some of the parts felt kind of rushed and underexplored, especially during the later stages of the game. Rapture as a setting is amazing. The mix of geometric and opulent art deco in its architecture spooky biopunk style genetic engineering gone wrong and World War II aesthetics within a dystopian crumbling underwater city combined to create an experience that is entirely unique to the world of Bioshock. The entirety of Bioshock, from its story to its environments, feels like an insane fusion of elements that you could only conceive in a fever dream, but when put together it just works. With the story taking place deep underwater, there is an inherent oppressiveness and weight to everything that is happening. The pieces of broken dreams left behind the people that once lived in the city add a layer of melancholy to your actions and the old-timey music that sometimes plays during shootouts feels cinematic as hell. That being said though, the game is kind of old and it definitely shows its age in some of the gameplay elements. While the different plasmids that you can use add variety to the combat, the gunplay doesn't feel great, and the boss battles are pretty underwhelming. The hacking mechanic that you use to open safes and to turn enemy turrets into allies also got pretty old pretty quickly. But despite those somewhat small issues, I still enjoyed the game a lot, and I can definitely see why some people consider it to be one of the best games ever made. Especially when taking into account that it was released all the way back in 2007. But yeah. If you haven't played Bioshock before and you think it looks interesting, I'd absolutely recommend you to try it. Slime Rancher is a kind of farming simulator game developed by Monomi Park released in 2014. 
In the game, you play as a slime rancher who has their own ranch on a distant planet inhabited by slimes. You catch slimes with your vacuum, put them in your farm, feed them, the slimes make a substance called plort that you sell for money, and then use that money to make your ranch better. There is a kind of a decent sized world outside of your farm to explore, that you unlock piece by piece where you find more slimes, food sources and loot that you can use to level up your farm. Overall, I enjoyed this game for the most part. The slimes are cute, and the gameplay loop of exploring, finding new slimes and upgrading your farm is pretty fun, at least in the beginning. The farming aspect of the game goes surprisingly deep as well. There are so many different types of slimes that you can combine together, and you're incentivized to diversify your farm and discover new types of slimes in order to make more money on the plort market, in which the prices are affected by the types of plort that you're selling. Also, if you wanted to make your farm more efficient, the game allows you to really go crazy with using teleporters and drones that automatically do a lot of the farming for you. But while I usually like making everything super efficient in games like this, I didn't feel the need to do that in Slime Rancher because after putting a decent farm together with a nice variety of slimes in just the starting area of the ranch, I had enough money to buy pretty much anything I wanted in the game and it took me only a couple of hours to get to this point. I had bought all of the upgrades to the ranch, and while getting to that point while experimenting with the different slime types and food resources was a lot of fun, I never felt like actually using any of the upgrades, aside from the ones that I had in the starting area, was necessary. Once you reach this point in the game, there is not really anything else that you can spend your money on except making your farm more efficient and in turn efficiently making even more money that you can spend on anything. The exploration element of the game is pretty limited as well and it doesn't take long to have explored the entire map. So when you're done with that, there is not much to do outside of just ranching slimes. Compared to other games in this genre like Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing for example, Slime Rancher's gameplay stays pretty one-dimensional. Like in Stardew Valley, the farming aspect in the beginning takes up a lot of real estate, but as things get going, it's only a small part of the game as other aspects like character interactions and PvE start taking more and more space. And while the farming aspect in Animal Crossing is very different, growing fruit and making money is just a tiny part of the game, while making everything look just the way you want it to and interacting with the NPCs as your game changes with every real world season is what gives Animal Crossing its almost endless well of content. In Slime Rancher, the game starts with farming as its focal point and never really moves forward from that. All in all, despite its lack of content, I did like this game and I was really into it for the first couple of hours of gameplay until I got bored. It is a cute game, and I like the slimes, and I also noticed that there is a sequel to this game that is in early access, which I'll probably check out when it eventually comes out. And that's all of the games. I feel like the randomizer gave me a pretty mixed bag this time, some of them I liked and others not so much, and if I shitted down your favorite game in this video, I'm sorry. Overall though, doing this, randomly picking games to play, it's a lot of fun regardless if I like them or not. At least I can check them off from my backlog and say that I've played them. Like, I probably would have never played Little Inferno or Luftrausers, which had been gathering dust in my library for years, if I didn't do it this way. Last time, some of you were inspired to try this yourself, which was really nice to see. And again, if you end up trying this, I'd love to hear what games you got and if you liked them or not in the comments. For myself, I'll keep continuing this series and making these types of videos every now and again, along with my other videos, until I actually end up playing everything from my backlog. If you want to see that, and if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. I also make other analysis style videos on gaming, and if that kind of stuff interests you, please check out my other videos out as well. And that's it, thank you so much for watching, have a good one.